So here on the main stage, we're thrilled to welcome our gold sponsor of Women in Data um, to the stage. These are trend-setting professionals in data science, and I'd love you to help me welcome both Gary and Lamilla from Lloyds Banking Group, who are applying sciences that are transforming the way that Lloyds Banking Group is working. How's everyone doing? We can't see you guys upstairs. Give us a wave. <laughs> we can, we can. So um, I'm Gary. I'm Ludmila. Hello, everyone. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about who we are and what we're doing. Um, but um, it's just about an hour after lunch, isn't it? So it's our job to try and keep you guys awake, I think. So we'll show you some videos and try and keep it a little bit more upbeat. We'll try and go quite quickly so you can ask questions. Um, but uh, yeah, let's see how we get on. So, so we're not here today really to tell you about Lloyd. Some of you may have heard about Lloyd. Some of you may bank with us. Um, where I'd love to get to by the end of our conversation today is to give you some sense that things really are changing. Um, so to build on what Catherine said, this is a very large organization. I'll talk about it in a moment. We're trying uh, very, very hard, both locally and as an organization, to change in the way that we've committed to. So, as I said, it's, it's significant. About one in two um, of the people in the country bank with Lloyd's, one of our brands at least. Um, we have about a million business organizations as well that we bank. We are the biggest uh, charity donor, corporate charity donor, certainly, um, in the country. And you may or may not know us as Lloyd's Banking Group, but maybe you know Lloyd's or Halifax or Scottish Widows or Birmingham Midshires or MBNA and some of our other high street brands. Um, we are seeing a very, very rapid move to digital, to mobile, to tablet, even to conversational interfaces and chatbots. Um, and for us, as data professionals, that's a wonderful opportunity. So today, we'll talk a bit about what we do as a team. Um, but uh, yeah, I encourage you to lean in and ask us whatever you want to ask. Um, so as I say, I'm Gary Sanders. I, you can all see me, so I didn't want to do a headshot. Um, the picture I have up here is something that I'm very, very passionate about. So I was lucky enough to start the team about three years ago, the data science team at Lloyd's. And we do machine learning. We build the chatbots. We do robotics, a range of things that sometimes get bucketed as, as AI. Um, but, but there are a number of things that when we set the team up, and, and Lamilla will also tell her story in a moment, They're really important to me. And diversity is one of them, and it sounds like a really cheap thing to say, but um, I take it personally. I have two daughters. I would love in 20 years that have a son as well, um, but I would love in 20 years for one or both of them to be standing up here talking about how their career wasn't defined by their gender. It was defined by what they wanted to do, their imagination, their talent, and everything else. And until we get there, I'll keep pushing. And we'll keep pushing as an organization, and I'll lean on everyone to keep pushing as well. And, and you guys are a huge part of it. Um, but the second thing, when I look at our trade, that's really important to me is the sense that AI isn't a black box. Um, we read and hear that so very frequently. And it will, it will cause all kinds of uh, misunderstanding, mistrust, those sorts of things. So, what you, what you can see instead of my picture behind me is something that we're working on that we call XAI, or Explainable AI. Um, and this is a combination of Lyme and Shap, for those of you that are data scientists in the room. Um, and we're working really hard, the number of the team are here, to figure out ways to make this fair, to make it accountable, to make it transparent so people can believe in it, they can trust it, so they feel as though they've got rights over how their data is being used. And hopefully you'll see some of that come out as we talk. Um, so a little bit about Lloyd's. As I say, we're trying to keep it quite focused on us as a team and, and what we do in data. But a little bit about Lloyd's. Lloyd's has made a number of public commitments to, um, to diversity. It, as you can see, these are awards that it we have received this year. Um, but there are a number of things that don't necessarily come across. So the, uh, the Top 50 Employers for Women Award, we're really very proud of. We've been in the Top 50 for five years running now. 
Um, we were one of the financial organizations, one of the first organizations indeed, to sign up to the Women in Finance commitment to having 40% of our senior leaders as females by 2020, and we're on track to achieve that. That's not, they're not just words, we, we live and breathe that every single day. And the commitment isn't just to gender diversity. Um, we make sure that we're doing the best for those of our colleagues who are carers, whether they're parents or, or other kinds of carers, um, to those of our colleagues um, who are in an ethnic minority, to those who may have disabilities, and to those from the, the various number of LGBT communities that we have in the organization. We take each and every one of those things really very seriously. Um, and Whilst this is lovely for us, for me to be able to stand here and have this behind me, it's, it's much more about how we live it and breathe it every day. And that, I hope, is what comes across. Um, I was one of Gary's first employees uh, when we started three years ago. And at that point, the team was just a bunch of people sitting together in a corner. Uh, and we only had our laptops. We didn't even have access to data, although we were asked to do data science. So it's exciting to see that fast forward to the present moment. Uh, we now have uh, over 100 permanent employees in the team. And we keep growing, and um, there are quite ambitious plan for the future. So uh, being on the journey um, and seeing all the change, being part of the change, uh, has been really exciting, and it felt uh, like a privilege. So uh, what I would like to do now is just to tell you about uh, some of the work that's going on in, in our team, although there are many, many projects now, but uh, we thought we would just share a few things and try to explain why um, those things are important uh, to us. Um, so that's me, and the reason we have music next to my name is because first, um, outside of data and work, music is kind of my biggest hobby and interest, but also because uh, music information retrieval uh, has been a one of the themes that we explored um, in the, um, at, at an a research and development offsite that we recently um, held. Um, and the reason I want to talk about our offsites, uh, and we held two of them this year, um, is because Gary just mentioned the importance of diversity and team building. And uh, we believe that events like this really um, serve those purposes very well. So the idea behind the offsites that we hold uh, is just to give um, our colleagues three days to be away from their day-to-day -day job, from their normal projects, and uh, in a distraction-free environment to work on uh, the projects of their choice, really. Things that they're interested in, some new data science topics, some new algorithms, some things they haven't come across before but, but would like to, to know more about. Um, and we've had quite uh, an impressive uh, selection of um, projects. So people self-organize themselves into several teams. Um, and um, interestingly, they uh, chose as teammates people uh, with whom they don't necessarily work that much um, in, in their usual jobs. Uh, sometimes they, they, they chose the same uh, people, but uh, there was no pressure either way. Uh, and it was really an opportunity for them to either build closer bonds uh, or new bonds with people, learn from the colleagues, and then share the results. Uh, so we, we had topics ranging from image and music classifications to automated machine learning to uh, beating arcade game with deep learning. So a really interesting selection of things. Um, in addition to kind of worrying about the well-being of our data scientists and making sure they feel inspired, we're also uh, trying to make sure that they can be productive. Um, and if we are to realize our vision of becoming a really data-driven organization, we really need um, to find a way to accelerate uh, how we do data science, to uh, do it smarter. And uh, one of the big stumbling blocks, which I think many data scientists in the room here can relate to, is the data wrangling. 
which I think according to some common estimates uh, take about 70-80% of uh, a data science work and by that we mean all sorts of activities relating to acquiring, understanding, interpreting, cleaning and preparing data for analysis. So having recognized the scale of this problem, uh, we have uh, recently launched an academic collaboration with the Alan Turing Institute. So we are uh, one of their partners in IDA project and IDA stands for um, Artificial Intelligence for Data Analytics. So the, the, their vision is to build a set of tools which can um, help semi-automate some of the more mundane tasks uh, that data scientists face. Um, and we're working with them to help shape uh, some of their work by sharing our problems, our kind of real world challenges, and we're hoping to then um, benefit from the tools that we're creating. Um, and then Closely linking with that stream of work with uh, the collaboration with the Alan Turing Institute is um, another uh, topic which is uh, of a, uh, a lot of interest to us uh, currently, and that is uh, AI safety. Um, I think that by now, most uh, people and organizations don't need convincing uh, that artificial intelligence can br bring a lot of value, that data science can allow us to do things we weren't uh, able to ever do before. And I think our management, our business stakeholders are the same. They, they can see the huge potential behind data science, but now the big question is, how do we do it safely? Um, and although we are not, uh, for example, a company producing self-driving cars where the, the issue of safety is very literal and you're talking about physical safety, nevertheless, as a bank, we understand that the consequences of things going wrong can be quite severe, and therefore this subject is taken very, very seriously. And, of course, AI safety has uh, many facets, ranging from uh, your data infrastructure, data protection, and, and, and so on. So we have many people with diverse skill sets um, working on this. Um, but for now, I, I think I'd like to mention just two aspects we are focusing on currently in, in our team. And the first one is the issue of model monitoring controls. And by that, we mean uh, how do we ensure that when we have models running in production, we can proactively take steps to make sure that everything is fine, and if something is looking a bit off, uh, not quite as expected, we can interfere and take a, s a set of actions. So we um, care about things such as, does our input data look all right? Does it look as expected? Is the data quality sufficient? Uh, does the output data uh, from the models generally look sensible? Are mo model predictions accurate? Do the assumptions then we've made that we've made when we uh, were modeling still hold? Um, and of course, there are all sorts of statistical tests, approaches uh, in textbooks and academic papers that um, have many answers to those questions. I think the challenge here is to put put them in the actual practical uh, context and decide what which of all those numerous uh, tests are most useful in each situation, and more importantly, what, what actions do we take uh, as a result of the test showing us that something is wrong. So that's so something we're working on, um, and we're hoping that we'll have a set of tools that help us deal with those things. And I suppose the second aspect of AI safety or even AI responsibility is that of the explainability of models. Um, and again, there, there are many aspects of explainability. I think that's quite a broad topic, but we are focusing currently on three pillars, which we think are really important. Um, the first one is to be able to answer questions like, what does a given algorithm generally do? How does it work? And being able to explain it to someone who is not 
uh, a data scientist, uh, but still needs to have a lot of confidence in, in, in the model and trust in, in the result it produces. Um, then the second pillar is um, being able to know which features, variables are important at model population uh, level. Um, and then the third one, and perhaps the most crucial one in practice, is being able to explain individual predictions of a model, that is, predictions for a given case or, uh, or a customer. Uh, and I suppose our long-term vision is to be in a position uh, when um, all our model users can have answers to those questions. And uh, by users, we mean business stakeholders, regulators, and even end customers. Because we think if an algorithm is making a decision um, which affects someone lives in so sometimes in quite big ways, such as will you get um, an approval for a mortgage, for example. A customer has a right to know what's going on, uh, how, how the decision uh, was reached, uh, what, what was important, and potentially challenge the model builder, because maybe there are some unconscious biases that uh, uh, people hold and are not aware of. So we, we would like to um, allow people to feel empowered to um, basically be in charge of their own data, recognize that it's their asset, um, and challenge, challenge as, a, as an organization if needed. Um, so this is just a video which will hopefully play from the R&D offsite that um, I have mentioned. Um, it's a short one, but I think it gives a feel of um, what our team is like. So our team is here uh, to test and explore emerging and new technologies, and we're really looking forward to the day. We're trying out these new technologies where they come uh, and actually test out the usability, the applicability, understand the limitation of these particular technologies. And this particular event provides them a fail-safe environment because this is just an experiment. The most exciting part of the event has been having that opportunity to take three days out of my day job um, to learn new things and to research into new technologies. I've never used TensorFlow before, so being able to use that. Getting ahead into the theory and then applying that kind of stuff as well was brilliant. Being able to interact with other people within the team and learn their expertise has been really good. Well, it's been great seeing all the activity over the last three days. The th there's a couple of things that really have come home to me. It's what a brilliant team that you've got, the diversity that you have, the way that you've been inclusive, and the different outcomes that you've all driven that have real impact, I think, for the bank going forward. Um. I think that overall, uh, it's an exciting time to be in the field of data science and AI currently. Um, it, it feels like data is um, the main engine behind the post-industrial revolution that's currently unfolding. And I think being part of that feels both like a privilege but also like a big responsibility because at the end of the day, uh, and data science models are just tools, uh, but whether those tools will serve a positive change or a negative change is very much down to individuals who build and use those models. Um, so I think there are many exciting things coming and we are growing. So if you feel that uh, the things we, we are doing are interesting and you would like to potentially help us figure out the answers to the big questions that we are facing, um, then please, by all means, check our uh, jobs webpage or, or come and talk to us afterwards. We have a stand in, in the hall. Um, and uh, Gary will now talk about uh, his, his vision of how some of the trends that we observe in our work will also unfold in, in the future uh, and what will be happening in the field of <coughs> AI more generally. Thank you. I'm not sure how I ended up with this. It was more of a Sanders come up with five things. So here we go, five things. Um, so each of these are in a kind of a less and more. I'm going to skip the less because it feels like it's a more day, if I'm honest. Um, so we hear and see, and many of us are involved in, ever bigger data. And that's a, it's a really good trend. As, as more things become more digital, there is yet more data for us to work with. And as 
a room full of professionals in data, it's a wonderful opportunity. However, we need to walk a mile in the shoes of the folks that we serve and those that consume what we're doing. If we load more and more and more information on them, we're going to make the job of making decisions harder and harder. I'm sure your inboxes are similar to mine. I can barely get through them most days. Um, and if we don't try really hard on our ever bigger data to find those really meaningful points that drive decisions, um, we're not helping those that need to make decisions. And, and that's you guys, too. Um, I liken this to a map app. If I'm trying to find a supermarket, I don't want a globe. I don't want to know how high the mountains are a couple of thousand miles away. I need something that tells me when I get to the end of the road, turn right, or there's some traffic, go this way around. And that's how I think we should start to think about the next five years. Is there's going to be more and more data. There is more and more digital interactions. But how do we step away from that and start to think, how do I make sure that I've got an equivalent amount of meaning um, amongst all this information? So. More decision making, more actions. That's the thing that I think in five years' time we, we will collectively conclude has been a success. Again, I'm going to skip the lessons and talk about mores. So more real time predictions, what's coming next? So again, there's ever more data. Um, particularly in industrial processes, Internet of Things type scenarios, um, factories and jet engines and oil fields and these kinds of things that are generating vast volumes of data, far more than any of us can really comprehend in any meaningful way. But what's emerging is something called a digital twin. It gives all of us the opportunity to look at that jet engine that might be a couple of thousand miles away from us, somewhere high in the sky, um, and do our test, do our prediction, do our analysis on that twin, rather than having to ground the jet and figure out whether the engine's worn out or anything else. And this concept of a digital twin is in that context, a, w a wonderful step forward because it means we, the empowered individuals who understand data and the tools around data, can find ourselves a whole heap of new opportunities. But also, when we begin to think about digital twin in the context of privacy and what that means to us as individuals, it has some different consequences and a different context to it. But nonetheless, I think we will increasingly find that rather than dealing with the physical artifact, we will spend our time as data professionals dealing with the digital version thereof. Um, the fact that that's what's going on with jet engines is wonderful because that's what keeps us all in the sky and safe. Um, so by no means do I think that this isn't something that we should all embrace, but it's certainly a trend um, that I think will have some unexpected consequences. So if I take that idea of more and more data and bring it back to the personal, well, let's look at a GP interview. If I go and see my GP, she'll She'll tell me I should, I should exercise less, I should drink more, maybe I should start smoking, that kind of thing. Love my GP. Um, but how much better would I make her life if I could share with her my Fitbit information? To her, that's external. To me, that's very, very personal. Um, she, I could share with her images. I could share a, a range of things which to her are external. To me, are very, very personal. And a number of them, particularly if we look at things like images, are certainly not in a tabular structure that many of us may have been used to working with. So I think when we get into this concept of digital twin and we get into the asset that is each of our data, a very, very personal asset, and the, the choice and the permission um, to share that, we could unlock things like personalized healthcare in a way that we've not really understood to date. Um, and again, that's a hugely exciting field for all of us to come back here in 10 or 20 years and to have made a meaningful difference to healthcare across the globe would be a wonderful thing for us all to have left behind. But we need not to walk past the privacy implications of it. We need to not walk past the permission implications of it as well. <clears throat> Less reductionist dashboarding. Let's talk about more, more natural language. So we particularly um, are seeing a very rapid rise. We build virtual assistants for the bank, chatbots, in other words, uh, amongst the other kinds of machine learning that we do. We're seeing a very rapid rise in the conversational interfaces, i.e. text messaging or even just a voice. Can, can you tell me what my balance is, please? Um, we have the tools. We can use NLP. We can use NLG. We can use a range of different things to try and determine meaning, structure, intent, that kind of thing from the data. Um, but we can already go a lot further 
than is currently accepted. We could, that, you know, those of us who spent a career building dashboards, hey, well, the machine could do that for us. Maybe it could nudge us in the direction of what's important. Maybe even, and we've been trying this, it can write some of the insight that goes with that alert to help us be that much more empowered. Um, as I say, the tools are already here. But the behaviors, the culture, the, our approach hasn't necessarily caught up. And I think over the next couple of years, it will very, very rapidly. And the last one is frontline empowerment. So we are a room full, all of you, all of us, are a room full of experts in data of, of, of different kinds. Um, and although I wasn't alive, um, 40 or 50 years ago, a computer was a huge, great big thing in the basement of an organization. And, only a handful of people could go anywhere near it, and they wore a white coat. And everyone else that did a real job couldn't go anywhere near the machine. They certainly couldn't sit down and ask it questions. How are things going to be next year? And that's obviously not how computing is today. All of you have on the table and in your pockets far more computing power than those huge, great, big things ever had. We can all go on the cloud and get much more computing power than existed on the planet back then. But it doesn't mean IT has gone away. It doesn't mean technology isn't here to stay. And I think, in some respects, we as data professionals are kind of in the lab coat era of our industry as well. It can feel threatening. It can feel alarming to imagine a world where what we do is in the hands of the front line. Where, what, what will we mean? How will we have value if those individuals are doing what seems like our job today? But I think if we go back and look at the trend of, well, computing became a much bigger pie. There are still many, many specialists in technology. There are huge, great, big, globally dominant forms, uh, firms in technology. And that, if we embrace it and be empowered by it, will be the trend that we all go on. So we don't need to sit here in five years and say, we're now running data science teams. Many of you will be, but hopefully, lots of you will be saying we're running businesses, because that will be the change that we need to go on. Now, that's just about, I think, all we have time for. Really, really proud and thrilled to be a partner of Women in Data. So thank you very, very much for having us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you both so much for such a wonderful session. Unfortunately, our schedule does not allow questions. I'm sure most of you are busting at the seams to ask, but we have uh, on the good knowledge that these guys will be at our networking session. So please try not to bombard them um, and uh, herd through them, but uh, please go one by one and ask all the questions you may have at 5.30. Thanks Thank for you having us. Thank very much for your time. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you for your time.